TFM. Welcome, boomers, to another episode of Warp 5, our dedicated Star Trek Enterprise podcast. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as he always is, is my esteemed co-host, Matthew Rushing. Matthew, I think you picked the perfect t-shirt to wear today. I just love that retro Quantum Leap shirt you've got on there. Well, I, you know, I definitely try. Um, you know, it's it's. Um, I try to look at the episodes and wear something uh, appropriate, and this seemed appropriate. So it's very um, appropriate. But I did have to go back in time to get it. So right. that was that was really the most interesting part uh, about that. So well, and but what's also interesting is apparently you need to take part in. A successful discussion of the Star Trek Enterprise episode detained in order to jump to mm-hmm. your next destination in your attempt to get home. Exactly. Well, well, let's do this. And luckily, for the first time ever, we have a holographic observer with us today to make sure that our discussion goes well. That's right. We're going to be talking about the episode detained today, which brings Scott Bakula and Dean Stockwell from Quantum Leap back together. In the Star Trek universe, if you need a refresher about the episode, here it is. After the Enterprise accidentally enters a military zone around the second moon of Tandara Prime, Captain Archer and Ensign Mayweather are captured and find themselves in Detention Complex 26, a facility that is home to 89 Sulaban prisoners. The events and interaction that follow shed light on the Sulaban in unexpected ways and also introduce links to the temporal Cold War through a story that is classic Star Trek allegory. All right, Matthew. So before we get into the real discussion, we've been talking about Quantum Leap here. Were you happy to see this reunion on screen? Um, you know what? Uh, and people are going to think this is uh, like crazy, but I've never seen Quantum Leap. Oh, okay. So but you know of it. You know of it. I do know of Quantum yeah. Leap. You know, I, of course, I knew uh, when... Uh, Scott got hired that he had been a part of Quantum Leap and that was one of the you know the the big things about this is he was going to be in another franchise and everything it is just one of those things where I missed it when it had come out and I have never gone back to watch it although I hear there's like talks of like some sort of reboot or something with it and so I'd be really interested to see whether or not they'll have uh, the you know the the original characters back or if it'll be completely new or, you know, so yeah, I mean, I, um, I'm really interested, uh, to get a chance to dive into it one day. It's just been one of those things that I missed. So what about you? Uh, was this something that, um, you know, you were looking forward to or, yeah. or you had seen before? Yeah. So my story about quantum leap is that when I was in university, my third year in university, my roommate was an exchange student from Russia. His name was Sasha. And we lived in an apartment on campus together. And he got hooked on Quantum Leap. And so Quantum Leap was playing in our living room all the time. And nice. I have at least passively seen probably most of the episodes. And I, I would not call myself a big Quantum Leap fan, I think the concept was interesting, and I like Scott Bakula. And when he got hired to do Enterprise, of course, my mind went straight back to all those days of watching Quantum Leap with Sasha. And when this episode came around, and I heard that they were going to bring Dean Stockwell back, and we were going to pair them up on screen again, I just thought it was kind of fun that that was arranged. And I wanted to see how it turned out. and. You know, I think it turned out well. They play well off of each other on screen always. And Mm -hmm. it was just a nice little little tidbit thrown in there for Enterprise. Yeah, no, I I think it's honestly, you know, kind of cool that they could do this. And it's just nice when you have those little just those little moments. Right. I mean, like they and they do this on a lot of different types of shows. Mm -hmm. So it's it. I'm I'm excited. So. Well, what was it? Boston Legal that was just getting all the Star Trek actors together in different combinations Pretty for much. a while, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so yep. that stuff does no, 100%. Happen. Yeah. 
All right. Well, let's get into the meat of this story. And it's it's a very serious story, in fact. And let's just start off with the very Star Trek Enterprise element of the story, which are the Sulabine. Mm-hmm. They decided to use the Sulabine here as the species, as the race that's being persecuted. What I liked about them making this about the Sulabine is that we get complexity to the Sulabine. Up to this point, we've seen Silic, we've seen the Sulabine portrayed as these genetically modified villains who are taking part in the Temporal Cold War, and Mm -hmm. they seem to be there to serve the role of villain. It's very convenient for the story. But here we find out that even Sulabine, who maybe appear to be genetically modified to Captain Archer, based on his experiences, aren't. And we get diversity in the race here. And then they can tell this story about how people are persecuted based on their appearance. Yeah, I mean, the one one of the biggest things I think that it is really smart is that all we've seen of the Sulaban is the Cabal. And so here, this gives us the opportunity to kind of break with Star Trek tradition and show, even in the first season, that the Sulaban are not a monoculture, that the Cabal doesn't make up all of the Sulaban. It is just a part of them. And I, I think it really gives us an opportunity to do something like you said here that to make them more complex, um, to dive into them as, um, I, I think, more nuanced characters and a more nuanced race. Because, I mean, we are a more nuanced race. And I think that's what is really important is that we do not just paint with broad brushes and so this does i think a very good job i mean that's its whole goal which is to not do that and i think it's a very smart move here really even in season one where we're still learning about the sulaban we're still learning about this temporal cold war and i think what this does is that it allows us to have nuance to the idea of the Temporal Cold War, but also to kind of get an opportunity to see how the Temporal Cold War is impacting other races in the first place. I think that, to me, is is very, very fascinating. And we get a very interesting picture as to what that looks like on a different world. Right. And, and we also learn here that you mentioned how are the races being impacted I don't know that this is directly related to the Temporal Cold War. They don't say that in the episode, but we do find out that the Sulaban homeworld became uninhabitable 300 years ago, mm-hmm. and yep. that's why they are a nomadic people, and they're scattered around. And it also explains why they would be susceptible to future guy or whoever yep. is giving them these genetic modifications, because they're trying to improve their situation. Absolutely. The view into how... A group of people are being affected by a conflict, I think, is a very important part of expanding, giving a glimpse into a culture. This is obviously we're Mm -hmm. going to talk about the allegory element a little bit later, but this episode is very intentionally an allegory for the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. It's stated in the dialogue in the episode. But keeping it in universe here, like you said, we're finding out that this temporal Cold War is impacting other groups of people who are involved in it in the same way that it's affecting humans. It's not affecting humans directly too much at this point. It's affecting the Enterprise crew. People on Earth are Mm -hmm. not aware of it yet, but they will be in time. And that is exactly what happens in the real world, where when there's a war, when there's a conflict, There's a small group of people from each side who are fighting, and then almost everyone else is just caught up in the middle. Yeah, I I like the the whole – it's interesting because I think, you know, when this came out, a lot of people immediately jumped to that this was about the Taliban and the idea of Middle Eastern people and us not lumping them all in together. Mm Mm-hmm. 
But what I think is fascinating about this, and, and as I watched the episode, what was really good about this episode is that, yes, you can make those illusions, right, to the those things that we've all lived through. But Again, this episode also harkens back to the idea of what happened to Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. It also, when you think about it, it it could immediately harken back to what happened to Jews right. in World War II. And this is uh, – it, you could go all the way back to – ancient Rome and what was happening to Christians once mm -hmm. they came on the scene, right? Like this is not something that is just one size fits all, right? And that only has one interpretation to it. And so I think that's the thing to me that makes this stand out is that this has more validity than just one side to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important actually because – you could pigeonhole this, but I think it would be a detriment to the story that they're actually telling because this is a story that has relevance today in the sense that we paint with a very broad brush and that we just lump all people together because, oh, they happen to be this or they happen to look like this or they happen to believe this. Like people and and races are much more complicated mm -hmm. than these broad brushes that we're painting with and so i absolutely just rewatching this episode i was struck by i think how much it has to say and yes it is a message episode but i think the message is more timeless than us just being able to pigeonhole it is to only talking about one specific thing yeah yeah, it's a good point because for the writers, it was a specific thing. But sure. for, for me, when I think about this episode, because of the timing of it, it aired on April 24th, 2002. Mm -hmm. And my recollection is that even the first time I saw it, I still felt like, oh, yeah, this is about the Taliban and it's about the U.S. internment of people in Guantanamo Bay who they mm -hmm. felt might have some connection to the 9-11 attacks. Yeah, and I mean, in in all reality, I think that, that you can't get away from that, right? right? No, um, I, I... And that's not necessarily... I mean, and again, it's not a bad thing. Either, well, no, because you know? that's a story so. that needs to be told. But I... I don't know if that was the intention of the writers because of the timeline of when the story would have been written and the actions that followed 9-11 because we're only talking about six, seven months here. Mm -hmm. I was still living in Japan in April of 2002. I moved back to the U.S. for a while in the summer of 2002. And so I believe that this episode I saw a little bit later that year. So mm -hmm. a bit more time had passed, which might be why for me, the connection was a bit stronger than it may have been sure. on April 24th. But regardless of the timeline, these days when I think about this episode, I tend to forget that it was written as commentary on the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. And I tend to remember it as being related to the 9-11 attacks. Mm -hmm. And it's only when I go sure. back and I watch it, then I, re I remember, okay, yes, this is actually intended to be about World War II. And Archer even brings mm -hmm. that up. It's, you know, it's stated there. So, and I yeah. think that's a good thing because like you're saying, we can go back in history. There are many instances of this thing happening throughout history and it's happening today and it will happen mm -hmm. in the future it's human nature and so in that sense this is it's a timeless allegory of just human yeah. behavior yeah no i i 100 percent agree with you on that and i think you know it, we see this playing out in very interesting ways i think in the sense that we don't necessarily see people being put in internment camps unless we're talking about you know china right. and the Uyghurs. well that's but where it's happening that's, right which, now yeah. yeah exactly but we do see people being put into 
societal jail right because they are assumed to be people who think or believe a certain thing just because they look like what you right. know they do they're yeah. white or black or i mean just and and so i think this is the thing that i found this episode to be so important of a reminder is that this is such a dangerous way to behave mm-hmm. that we would immediately lump people in just because they look a certain way just because they believe a certain thing you name it i think it's all very very dangerous yeah and so i i think that's the thing for me that that i i just this is um this is an important episode and it should not be discounted because of that because i think if we are honest with ourselves, we have to look at ourselves and say, there, there's a lot that's not great mm-hmm. with the way in which we react to our, you know, to people. Yeah. Um, and so, well, you talk about societal jail. I think it's an excellent point because it's sort of a, a virtual parallel in a way to this kind of thinking anyway. You know, I, I don't want to draw comparisons mm-hmm. to what happened to Japanese Americans or anyone else who was literally detained in history because it's not the same thing. But it's the mindset of judging people based on their appearance, their nationality, their religious beliefs, whatever. And I find it interesting these days when you look in social media, especially, I just saw this yesterday, actually, where someone was calling for celebrities to be basically canceled because they said, you know, they there are allegations of this or that behavior that I don't like. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know... The word allegations means that someone has alleged, has said that this person did something. Right. You know, in my work, I deal with actual journalism. And there's a reason why, if you read something written by a journalist, a news service, Mm -hmm. it says, so-and-so allegedly did this. So-and-so is accused of doing something. You cannot assume someone is guilty unless they've been put on trial and actually found guilty of something. Right. But, but yeah, we live in a world today where mere allegations are considered proof and judgment is passed. And yep. that is, in a sense, what we're talking about here in this story as well, with you know no real evidence mm-hmm. other than it appears to me that probably you're involved in something that mm-hmm. you should be detained for. Yeah. Well, and I think I really like what you point out there. And and one of the most dangerous things, I think, is this idea of people being judged in the court of public opinion before actual facts come out. Right. And, And I mean, I think that we can look at our world right now and we can see the many different ways and places to which people have been maligned publicly, even though. Once the facts come out, that is not the case. Right. That that is um, that is a lie. And so I, I think that's the thing here that's we, we've just gotten so used to jumping on things and pretending as if they are true. Just because we heard it online, basically, you yeah. know, or, you know, and, and so, I, yeah, again, like. And that's the that's the thing that's so kind of beautiful about this episode is these people literally haven't done anything, right? Right. You know, and and so that's the danger of what we're talking about. And I, I think it's it's um, I just like it. I I like that this episode is willing to tackle this, and I like that this episode is willing to create this distinction between the Suleban and the Cabal and that they are different things and that we should not assume that uh, everybody, just because they look a certain way or or believe a certain thing, is is the same, you mm-hmm. know? And 
it's again, I, I just think it's it the 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 point of this is that we need to be reminded every single day of this, you know, because that's that's the unfortunate reality of the world that we live in, is that we do need to be reminded of this stuff. And uh so yeah, I mean it it's kind of sad that we have to have that reminder, right? You you would think that our our long sad history as human beings that we wouldn't have to be continually reminded about these things, but we do because we forget. And that's what stories like Star Trek are able to do. And and I do think that that's one of the places where I disagree with uh Mike Sussman who kind mm. of had a problem with this being an allegory episode yeah. um, because he didn't like things being so on the nose and message shows. Right. But to me, and I 100% agree with him mm-hmm. in the sense that I do not like shows preaching at me in that way. Right. Um, well, that's why you and I like DS9 so much because it doesn't yes, exactly. do that. Right. Yes, it doesn't. No, but I think... I do think that this show is reminding of us of a timeless truth that we mm-hmm. have struggled with for so much of our history. And in reminding us of that timeless truth, I think that it does us a service instead of a disservice. Mm-hmm. Now, I do think that there are places, obviously, where shows are literally just they've started with a message and they drill that message into you hardcore and they don't let up and it's just kind of relentless and i don't feel like this episode is like that and and so i guess my question that i really have for Mm -hmm. you is do you feel like that do you feel like that mike sussman has a, a legitimate complaint against this episode or do you feel like maybe it's misplaced about this episode specifically yeah yeah i found this interesting because this story is by Rick Berman and Brandon Braga, but Mike Sussman and Phyllis Strong wrote the teleplay. And so I think that's the reason Mike Sussman was commenting on it in the first place. The actual article, this was April, May 2004, Star Trek Communicator magazine, where he was talking about this. And the article itself is like a rundown of the season, everything was going that was going on and he talks about you know various stories and then they get to this one and he makes this comment and he said that the experience with the anti-prejudice theme of detained honed his opinion of message shows and he said i'm just not a big fan of allegory episodes people get on their soapboxes and talk about the original series and how it was always about something they always bring up let that be your last battlefield plato's stepchildren and the vietnam one a private little war They were just a little too obvious for me. And I think he has a point about the original series. That was the style of the original series very often. To go into an episode with a message, with a point, everything's built around it. And at the end, you're told which side you should be on. Mm -hmm. What's right, what's wrong. It's a black and white type of story. I get his point with let that be your last battlefield. I mean, that one's very much on the nose, right? But I I think that some of Star Trek's best stories are rather on the nose allegories. I mm-hmm. think it's something that sets Star Trek apart from some other science fiction shows. I think at times mm-hmm. it's done poorly. It's too transparent. Yes. Yeah. And then I think at times it's done very well where, yeah, it's still transparent. You can see exactly what they're getting at, but it's still a good story. And the message mm-hmm. you take away from it is a good message. Right. I think that yeah. there are people, and this is not a criticism of, of anybody. Everyone is different in how they take in things and process them. But I think there are some people who enjoy taking in a complex commentary on an issue and kind of unraveling that Mm -hmm. themselves. And there are people who like for things to be presented much more clearly and maybe need things to be presented much more clearly to take the point that the writer is trying to make. And so Mm -hmm. I think there's a place for that type of storytelling 
in Star Trek. So I don't completely agree yep. with Mike Sussman. I think that now he didn't say that he thinks there shouldn't be allegory episodes. He just said that he's not a big fan of allegory episodes. Maybe right, kind of like right, I'm right, not a big right. fan of Klingon episodes, but of course they have their place and sometimes they serve important roles in mm-hmm. the overall narrative. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of mixed on it, but I would rather have on the nose allegory stories from time to time in Star Trek than not have them. And mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think this one, I was going to mention when you were talking earlier, I think that this episode gives us the core of what Star Trek is, what makes Star Trek Star Trek, in that it sheds light on a specific issue of judgment and persecution. And mm-hmm. it tells us that that is not how we should look at people. Archer finds that out. Archer sees the child and says, I can't believe you're doing this to your kid. It's too young to be genetically manipulating him. And he's told, no, just a normal kid. We're not part of the cabal. We're not those genetically manipulated people. And then Archer realizes that, oh, you know, I've misjudged. The Suliban aren't who I thought they were. They're not all like Silic. And I think that's the core idic message of Star Trek and it's the core of Star Trek that seems to be lost on a large portion of the fan base these days, where we do see people who are clearly huge Star Trek fans, but yet are not open to diversity that doesn't align with their own view of the world. And it doesn't mean that I say you should be tolerant of people who are doing terrible things. I'm not saying that. But people who do have different views on issues than you, those people, you you should listen to them because that's the whole point of Star sure. Trek. It's what Star Trek's yep. been teaching yep. us for 56 years yep. now, right? Well, and I think I will say that, too, there are some points to which in I think in newer Star Trek they are saying that if you have a certain yeah. if you have a certain vo- viewpoint that does not agree with the one that is being proposed on the show that you are completely in the wrong because what I think is interesting about this episode is that it shows why a little bit that they would be reacting the way they are with the Cabal because when you see the Tendaran captain talk about all of the losses that they've suffered as a race because of the Cabal, I think it puts it into perspective, right? right. And what's great is that this episode is actually a g- good precursor to what's going to happen in season three, right? right? Yeah. What is going to happen when Earth is put up against the wall Mm -hmm. the same way that these people have been put up against the wall. And what we see and what we're going to see is that we react very similarly. Right. Right. So I think there's a lot of nuance here in this episode. You, I mean, people might not think that, but I do, I see the nuance here. And I do think that obviously Archer is on the right side of of saying that these people don't deserve to be treated like this. But at the same time, I think this episode does help us see how this type of thing does happen because, uh, you know, uh, why people react the way they do. And so, and in all honesty, we've seen that play out over history many, many times. So what we are seeing is the fact that even as humans, we haven't necessarily learned, right? And so I think that's one of the things where I see the difference in the way that I think that this episode kind of tries to play, not necessarily both sides, but help us to see both sides. And that's the kind of nuance that Deep Space Nine did so well, where it's like, we're going to present something to you. And yes, we, we might kind of come down on one side in the end, but at the same time, we are going to make it a little bit less easy for you 
to just like say, oh, well, there isn't a point of view that we should be paying attention to right. here right. on the other right. side. Right. Because here, you can understand why the Tandarans are reacting this way. It's a natural reaction. They've suffered a lot as a result of the cabal, and they feel the need to protect themselves, and they decide that just rounding up all the Sulabine is the best way to do that. And I think that's human nature. If we don't mm -hmm. use our yeah. minds a bit more and really try to think about things in more detail and consider individuals instead of faceless groups. And it's understandable their reaction. And then Archer comes to the realization of what's going on. And right. I, I think that nuance is very important to the story. And I think that's a message that the world today does need to be reminded of is that we can take the mm -hmm. easy way out and we can just make quick judgments based on our own feelings, ignore evidence, not listen to the other side. And that's the easy way out. Or we can work harder and actually yeah. listen to each other and to find solutions. And especially when you're dealing with conflicts and wars, remember that most people in this world are mm -hmm. people. We may be yep. different races. We may have different skin colors. We may have different genders and sexual orientations, and we live in different countries. But most of us want the same thing in life for ourselves mm -hmm. and for our children, for our families. And it's a small group of people who are fighting these wars. And yeah, we can't. Yeah. And, and 100%. that could be a hot war, like an actual like World War II fighting. Or it could yep. be these shouting wars that we get on social media, these cultural wars that are going on. Most people aren't involved in those things. And I think we, we need to keep that in mind and, and stay open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to have open dialogue or, yeah. or we're all doomed. Right, right, right. Well, and, and again, I think this, this comes down to the idea of, of like uh, really listening to each other mm -hmm. like and, and really seeing that in the end we are not all just the same we are not all just people that you can lump into categories and easily codify and disregard because of that reason and i think that's the, that's really what this episode is trying to show right I, I think that it does do a fantastic job of showing why we would feel threatened but that we need to find it in ourselves to overcome being threatened. Right. Yeah, that's the um, thing. That we have to reach deeper, right? Yeah. That our, our basis instinct is there, but that we should be better to be able to overcome it. And I think there's that's the beauty of this. There's just nothing wrong with showing how dangerous that can be. Yeah. And I, I think... Um, I'm very thankful that, you know, this episode was willing to tackle that. And, you know, um, it's a 42 minute episode of television. And that means that it, it could probably always have been done better. Right. But I think that this episode does a pretty decent job of, of uh, being quite nuanced for 42 minutes of television. And... I think something I wanted to talk to you about, because I think it's really interesting, this is an episode where, you know, we, we've had Archer, uh, you know, to Paul even mentions to him, she says, you know, I, I thought you weren't going to be intervening in uh, other cultures problems anymore. And he's like, well, I'm making the exception this time. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's it's uh, it's basically the same thing that we see Kirk yeah, do, right. we see Picard do, yeah. we see all of our captains do, right, yeah. um, where they... They're going to put aside basically the prime directive because they believe the morality of the situation overcomes it almost, you know? And so I, I thought that that was really funny about this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so it's commentary on Star Trek itself. <laughs> it is, right? Commenting it, it on yes. All the Star Trek she that is. came before this, right? Yeah. 
Yes, yeah. she absolutely is. And I found that very hu- amusing. Right. So. But it's true. I, every captain has done that. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And uh, we often think of Kirk as being the one who did that the most. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, actually, uh, they've all they've all done that. So. And and I, I think. You know, it's it's something to which it's important for us to be able to enjoy. And I think. It's important for us to be able to point out. And, and and I think that is one of the things that kind of makes Enterprise a little bit more interesting sometimes to me because it is willing to ask that those questions, right? Like Archer and, and Archer is willing to live up to that. He says, like, no, I'm putting it aside, you know, and, and mainly he's he, he is putting it aside because he thinks it's too important to just let this go that it would be wrong for him to let this go. And to me, that's just kind of fascinating. Yeah. And I'm glad that, uh, and, you know, as we move forward, I, I'm not going to say this is this is going to continue to be something that they they do perfectly, but I hope that we see this continue as we rewatch this, the seasons. I'm going to be watching specifically to see if we kind of dive into this even deeper as we move forward. Right. Yeah. Well, it's human nature for him to do that and for many of our captains to do that. And that's yeah. where I think yeah. the idea of the prime directive is noble in its conception, but in its practice implementation would be very mm-hmm. difficult to work if we're yeah. telling stories about human nature. And I think what we're saying about how we must listen to each other, even if we don't agree, we must have dialogue. Mm-hmm. We must look at the facts, what really happened, and not just what we think happened or what sure. offended us to make judgments on situations and then do what's right. Mm-hmm. We we shouldn't always right. turn a blind eye to something because, oh, well, this group of right. people, this is what they believe and it works for them. And so let's just stay out of it, even though they're doing something terrible. We can't be like that. Well, but and work to not bend the facts to our ideological bent, right. and then just reject facts because they don't fit yeah. in with our ideological bent. I think that's the thing to which is the most damaging, and 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 really, that kind of this episode doesn't speak to this, but I think it's the the way that this subject matter is presented here. If it was done today, I think that there might be more, even more nuance to it because that's the next iteration that we've seen mm-hmm. where I'm presented with facts. I don't like those facts. And so therefore I reject something out of hand when the facts are literally staring you in the face. And we're seeing that like all over the place today right. where we're, we're just then making arbitrary decisions based off of nothing but our own political ideologies yeah. basically yeah so. yeah exactly well i guess the last point i would say on that is that would you do see something these days whether it's in social media mm-hmm. or whether it's on one news source go look for the same information from multiple places i mean you have to get sure you have to get the information and that's not even a commentary from me about TV news, that's more just social media. Like you see a headline go by. Yep. Yep. The headlines don't mean anything. The journalists don't even write the headlines. Editors write headlines and they write headlines to get you to click on things so that they can make money from ad revenue from the clicks. That's how publishing works. That's the field I work Mm -hmm. in. I, I know how it works. So when you see something, don't get all worked up about it because you saw it go by or you heard it from one person. Take the time and go do some research. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes. I, I promise you that in most cases, five minutes of research will cause you to start questioning, okay, what's really going on here? Mm-hmm. And and yeah. I think, again, yeah. that's what happens to Archer here. He very quickly starts thinking, yes. well, what's going on here? Yeah, follow. And, and I, yeah, that's, I mean, I think the biggest thing and the best thing that you can do is, you know, um, to follow a variety of different types of people, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think that's that's the interesting thing here is that what we do see is that they just uh, 
they have the evidence that these aren't cabal and yet they have been so influenced by what has happened because of the cabal that they assume yeah. that given the choice, these people want to be with the cabal, right. even though that's never been proven. Yeah, exactly. So. All right. Well, any final thoughts on this and what's your rating, Matthew? Yeah, I mean, Chris, I really – rewatching this episode, I was really struck by, one, how much I thought it had to say and in how even more relevant it was today. And – I was also struck by the fact that it was interesting that we had an adventure where Archer goes with Mayweather. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, and, and I think Mayweather uh, gets some nice moments in, in this episode. I also love that we tackled the Cold War, uh, the temporal Cold War in a completely different way. Right. Which was, you know, it, I think it brought it to us in, in a really uh, unique way, but it helped remind us that it's out there. And I think that this also did a great job of showing that it doesn't just impact humans, right? It, it's impacting a lot of people. And so, to me, all of that was fascinating. So, I'm going to give this four and a half out of five detainment camps. Wow. All right. Well, I found it interesting that. I believe this was the least viewed episode of season one. And again, I don't know what that means because there can be many factors that affected how many people viewed it. I think that it's certainly not one of the most fun episodes of season one to watch because the subject matter is very serious and heavy and it's not an episode when I'm thinking, okay, I want to watch an episode of Enterprise. What should I put on? Detained is not an episode that I really want to go back and watch often. Maybe because, again, the subject matter is very heavy. But as we've discussed here, I think that they did a good job in 42 minutes of addressing a very important issue a dark moment in history and one that keeps repeating itself and reminding us that we have to always stay vigilant or this type of thinking will take over again and we'll keep repeating the same mistakes. So I, I think if I'm judging it as an episode of Star Trek that hits the core of what Star Trek is supposed to be about, what it was intended to be about, I think it does a very nice job. So I'm going to give it seven misjudgments. Nice. All right, everyone. Well, we would love to hear your thoughts on Detained and the things that we talked about today. There are many ways for you to share those. The best way to get involved in a discussion is to go to our listeners group on Facebook, the Babel Conference. We'll put a post there for this episode and you can join in the conversation with fellow listeners and Matthew and I are there as well. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field and it should come right on up. If not, just type the Babel Conference if you're not already a member. It is a closed group, so please do answer the questions and agree to the rules of the forum so I can let you in. And we'd love to hear your thoughts there. You can also find us on Twitter and elsewhere in social media where our username is trekfm. And if you'd like to send us email, you can do that by going to our website, trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and choose Warp 5, and that email will come to Matthew and me. And also, if you would like to leave a rating or a review, rating and review of the show, we would love to hear that as well on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you're listening. If that function is available, we would love to get your rating and review. So Matthew, when you're not practicing hanging upside down in spider webs. As you prepare for next week's discussion, where can people find you? Well, yes, it would be very helpful to be Spidey in that ep next episode. But uh, when that's not happening, you can find me all over the place on social media under the name MattRushing02, whether that's Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, Vero, all those type of places. Of course, uh, here on the network, I've got the whole other side of the network. We've got running the 602 Club, and you can find all of the fandoms we love, not just one, as well as a couple bonus shows in that same feed. So you get a lot of bang for your buck over on the 602 Club. Uh, you can also find me here doing literary tracks as well as the Orb. 
uh, literary treks, books in the comics of Star Trek, and then the orb. Chris, you and I, we talked some Deep Space Nine, which we always love, and we're so excited to be doing that again. So hopefully people will join us. And then you can find me on the Nerd Party Network with two shows. One is a completed show I did with Drea Kaufman, and we called that Owl Post because we talked about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series one chapter at a time. Uh, and then... You can find me doing aggressive negotiations with John Mills as we talk about Star Wars each and every week. But Chris, you know, um, maybe when you're not complaining about the food to the staff here at this establishment, where could people find you? Yeah, I definitely could go with some better food for sure. So you can find me down at the convenience store, browsing the shelves down there to see what I can find. But when I'm not doing that, you can find me elsewhere here on the network, as you mentioned, talking Deep Space Nine with you on the Orb. And we are very happy to be back covering DS9 with bi-weekly episodes of the Orb now. So if you were listening to us before and uh, you dropped off because we hadn't done new episodes in a long time, please go back over and resubscribe and catch our discussions of the Orb. Also, Larry Nemechek and I do the Ready Room from time to time, and I pop into literary tricks now and then. I haven't been on there in a while. I'd like to do that again sometime soon. And also have Interphase and other things going on. And as always, my work in publishing and the business magazine and all the other stuff that's going on there is keeping me very busy. But I am happy that I'm being able to squeeze a little more Star Trek in these days because that helps keep my mood up a little bit, even if the episodes are very serious. And if you'd like to chat with me about Star Trek or Japan or whatever, you can find me on Twitter. My username is C Brian Jones. That's letter C and Brian with a Y. That's my username everywhere in social media. But Twitter is where I am most active. And I'd love to hear from you there. Now, if you would like to help us keep Warp 5, the Orb, the 602 Club, everything else we're doing going, we could definitely use your help through Patreon. It's been a very tough couple of years and we are trying to get things moving forward again, but we do need your help. To find out how to get involved in the network and to help us out, keep these shows going, just visit patreon.com slash trekfm and you can find out more there. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. And a huge thank you to everyone who is supporting us right now. You're keeping us going. We would not be able to do this without you. So thank you so much. Well, Matthew, I mentioned spider webs a moment ago, and that is going to be very important. I need to practice as well, because next week we're going to be talking about Vox Sola. Well, uh, Chris, I'm going to go get a fly swatter and some bug spray, and let's go. <laughs> <laughs>